Well, good, good morning, morning, everyone, and welcome to our time of gathered worship this morning. Welcome if you are joining us via Zoom, and we can see lots of hellos and uh, the competition of where everyone is this morning happening in the chat function. Uh, welcome to those watching on the Facebook live stream as well. And if you are watching in the future, you are also very welcome on the recording of the service today. Provoking faith is how Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church has been living out our commitment to fellowship with one another and also to our vision statement during lockdown and this time of pandemic, uh, which encourages us to provoke faith in the heart of London. I'm Luke, I'm one of the deacons at Bloomsbury and I'll be chairing our time together this morning. And as always, we will be multi-voiced. Um, so there'll be a number of people contributing to this morning who will be introduced as our time together progresses. There are lots of names popping up on the screen on the chat function, and I'm sure more will join us as the service continues. And do remember to keep interacting with us using the chat function to say hello, but also later on in the service to share your thoughts after the sermonette in the discussion time. So let's now come together in worship reading the print in bold. God of love and life, we gather together today as those hungry for love, for justice and for forgiveness. Give, Give us, us today, today our, our daily bread. bread. We long to receive sustenance for our souls and to be deepened in our trust of your gracious provision. Give, Give us today, today our, our daily, bread. daily bread. As you care for the wheat fields that turn into bread and the vineyards that labour to produce sweet wine, we give thanks for the gifts you give us. Give, give us, us today, today our, our daily bread. bread. We are the body of Christ and we offer to you our bodies in all their frailty asking that we will receive what we need for healthy living. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. As your body remembered in this place, we come to receive the nourishment of your word and we offer to you the harvest of our souls. Give, Give us, us today, today our, our daily, daily bread. bread. And so let us pray. pray. Gracious God, when despair for the world grows in us and we wake in the night at the least sound with fear of what our lives may be, we turn to you, Lord, to rest our heads on your lap, to come into the peace of your divinity, to come into the presence of still water. For a time we can find rest in the grace of Christ, and we are free. Amen. And now we will join together as one voice in many homes, praying together the words that Christ taught his disciples. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We have some notices this morning and I'm going to hand over to Simon to chair this particular section. Good morning. Um, yes, I have some sad news to share at the beginning. Um, Nickwith, who is one of our deacons at Bloomsbury and uh, you know the family there are well known to many of us at the church, uh, messaged me overnight to say that her brother Rian has died. Uh, we don't know the details at the moment, so please hold Nickwith and Marina and Rejoice and, and the rest of the family in your prayers at this difficult time. 
this week has been uh, a week of prayer and uh, some of us have been getting up at seven in the morning well getting up before seven in order to be online at seven for a 15 minute start the day with prayer and others have been joining at 7 p.m in the evening to close the day with 15 minutes of prayer uh, we've been focusing on our values statement that Bloomsbury uh, put together after a period of discernment last year and uh, it's been really uh, really enriching to spend time with these values that underlie our fellowship so uh, I want to say a particular thank you to those who've taken uh, lead in uh, leading various sessions um, they've been they've been really really thought-provoking and have framed our week of prayer this actually came about because uh, uh, some of you may remember a few weeks ago, Frank made a comment in a service. I think it was just in the chat. Uh, Frank Brown said, we need, to, we need to pray more. So we thought, let's do it. So Frank, thank you for that. Uh, it's been a good week that you inspired there. I'm particularly grateful also to Helen for taking a lead in organising it. We have our final time of prayer today at two o'clock. Um, the links have been on the uh, mail outs that have gone out from Libby. So you should all have those. And we're going to meet for half an hour at two o'clock. And we'll be spending time at two o'clock going through kind of all of the values that underlie Bloomsbury and holding the church in prayer before God at, uh, at this time of uncertainty for our fellowship. Um, I'm going to ask Susan now if she would uh, be prepared to unmute for a moment. And uh, Susan, could you tell us again about the Just Transition campaign and what we need to do to sign up to be part of that? Hi, yes. Um, so in essence, the Just Transition campaign is looking about how climate change policy in our city can help those who most need it and who are, you know, low income or disabled and currently face problems due to that and due to the way that our city is set up. Um, and so what we're doing at the moment is the listening campaign where we just want to, well, Citizens has asked us to listen to our communities and basically find out what those problems are. Um, so it can be anything from high heating bills to, um, you know, public transport doesn't suit your needs. Um, even things that don't even seem immediately climate related often actually are or can be solved with climate change policy. So even if you can't think of any way that um, climate change or that kind of thing currently affects your life, please do come along because um, I believe that everyone will have something of value to share. Um, you're circulating, you're running several of these listening sessions, is that right? You're, you're yes. giving a number of, a range of options of times people could join you. Yep, and I had the link open to copy and paste. Marvellous. Just sorry, I will copy and paste it into the chat. The link that's going to appear in the chat is um, a link to a kind of a Google form, which is where people can sign up for which one they want to come to, and then you'll send them the appropriate link uh, to click to join it at the time that they've chosen. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Um, we've asked you to indicate um, which of three times you're free at. Uh, they start from tomorrow evening. So a quick response would be really appreciated. Um, basically so that we can allow as many people as possible to attend a session. So please indicate any of three sessions you're um, available to attend. Um, and hopefully by tomorrow at 12 p.m. midday, um, I should be able to send out the links for anyone who's attending the Monday evening. Um, but I really would appreciate if as many people as possible could answer the film today. So, so. We, we've optimistically promised citizens that we're going to listen to 20 people from Bloomsbury, haven't we? Yes. Uh, we're not limited to 20, but uh, th this is a, a strong invitation. If you want to be part of basically fixing, or, uh, not fixing, um, discerning, putting pressure on what London's climate strategy is going to be like over the next few years, and this is a you know, we've had a sermon around this, we had a service looking at climate care. This is a core gospel value for us. So if you want to be part of that, do respond to Susan and let her know. And uh, I thoroughly endorse this. So thank you, Susan. That's really helpful. Um, 
Okay, uh, now there's just a, a couple of joyous news. So, um, Philip Luke, I believe it is your birthday today. So, happy birthday to Philip. But that's now going to be shaded slightly because uh, uh, Jeff's asking, do you have to be a London resident? Um, uh, Susan might answer that in the chat. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. Um, I think if you're part of a London institution such as Bloomsbury, you have a voice on this. But Susan can confirm that. Um, so Philip, I'm afraid you're um, going to be put in the shade slightly with your birthday because on Tuesday, it is Elsie's 90th birthday. Now, I am assuming Elsie is listening in. Uh, Elsie calls in on her phone because she doesn't have the internet at home. And I can see we've got four people dialed in on their telephones. So I'm really hoping one of those is Elsie because uh, Elsie, happy birthday for Tuesday. And um, we've prepared a little something for you. So, uh, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Elsie, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Elsie. <laughs> right, I'm going to uh, shut up for a bit and let others take the lead. Thanks, Simon. We are now going to have our Bible reading for this morning, which is going to be brought to us from Jean-Marc and from Evelyn. Good morning. Um, we're reading this morning from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Peter heals a crippled beggar. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And the man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. Thank you for sharing the word this morning. And now Simon is going to bring us our sermonette for today. Thank you. Thank you. So my thesis for this morning is this. I think that the least interesting thing about someone who is homeless is the fact that they are homeless. There is so much more to a person than where they sleep at night or how much money they have available to spend. And yet the irony is that for most people who live without stable housing, this is the defining aspect of their lives, particularly in terms of their interactions with others. And as we come to the end of our short series we've had over the last few weeks looking at justice issues in which we've considered a Christian approach to rethinking the benefits system, the importance of ecological justice and the welcoming of refugees, 
Today, we're going to be thinking about homelessness and what a Christian approach to this might begin to look like. The scene which Luke paints for us in our reading this morning from the Book of Acts is as contemporary as it is ancient. It could be any street in any city in any country. From Bloomsbury to Bangalore, the picture is as familiar as it is troubling. A man has placed himself on the pavement at a busy intersection and is begging for money. And if you've walked the streets of London over the years, you will be no stranger to those who sit and beg. Whether they present with a disability or a note written on a piece of cardboard, the message, the request is constant. Please, can I have some money? And I wonder, what, what do you do? Do you walk on by, ignoring the person to the best of your ability, pretending not to have noticed them? Do you perhaps genuinely not notice them, having become so habituated to their presence that it is indeed possible to pass by unseen? Do you mutter a prayer for them? Do you give them some money? Do you make eye contact and offer an apology, or perhaps more accurately, an expression of sorrow for their condition before moving on? Do you offer to buy them a coffee or a sandwich? Do you stop for a conversation, try and find out a bit more about their circumstances? Well, I've done all of these things and more. And what breaks my heart is that I genuinely don't know if any of it has actually made any difference. And it was no different in the first century with our anonymous friends sitting outside the temple in Jerusalem, strategically positioned in prime location by the gate called Beautiful. In a scene with disturbing similarities to street theatre, he's carefully positioned himself to kind of contrast his own deformed body with the soaring architecture of the temple. Carefully constructing a scene to elicit maximum sympathy and of course cash from those entering the temple. And the sight of this man would have posed a troubling question to those passing by. How could a person with their eyes turned to God ignore the plight of one of God's suffering children? So I'm sure that many of those who came to the temple gave to the beggar at the beautiful gate, believing that by doing so they were offering this unfortunate man a tangible expression of the care that God had for him. There was a strand of ancient thought that regarded misfortune in life as a curse from God, as if in some way a person deserved their deficiency. And in our sermons earlier this year, earlier in the summer from the book of Job, we saw how that ancient text challenged this way of looking at things. Who deserves to be uh, living with a disability or whatever? That, that was all challenged in the book of Job. But here in this scene before the temple, we find an ancient echo of perhaps the more contemporary debates we often hear around the deserving or undeserving poor. Those who enjoyed power, wealth and health in the ancient world, as indeed in the modern world, tended to believe that they had received these things as a gift from God that they somehow deserved which then left those from whom such benefits had been withheld by God or fate or whatever, to fulfill the role of undeserving scrounger. Well, it's into this context that Peter utters his famous line, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. And on such a sentence, the world turns upside down. Because in this simple statement from Peter, the basic transaction which lay at the root of the Jewish temple system's charity was subverted. The beggar knew how it was supposed to work, the worshippers knew how it was supposed to work, the temple officials knew how it was supposed to work. The way it was supposed to work was that the temple system represented middle class religion primarily populated by those who had money, and the wealthy worshippers' job on their way in to worship was to give alms to the poor. And the job of the poor 
was to receive the handouts. It was a tried and tested system and everyone felt better in the process. The small acts of kindness directed towards an undeserving or even culpable poor appeased the consciences of the rich and simultaneously kept the poor in a state of dependency and disempowerment. It was a system of mutual meeting of needs, but one which was ultimately powerless to effect genuine change. It was into this context that Peter and John conducted their transgressive act against this system of inequality that everyone had become so complicit in. They didn't give alms to the beggar. They didn't give him silver or gold or even a few copper coins. They refused the transaction of handing over money in exchange for a temporarily salved conscience. Instead, Peter looked the beggar in the eye, reached out a hand and lifted him up. This was deeply subversive stuff because it challenged all the implicit and unspoken assumptions about the way the world works. In most societies, including our own, the poor are not really to be lifted up. They're not to be looked upon as equals. They're to be ignored, vilified, blamed, stigmatized, done unto, and institutionalized and disempowered. If you don't believe me, just read some of the newspapers. In the first century, the poor were there to provide a, a kind of a weak to the temple systems strong. And I don't think it's so different in our world today. The poor are useful in a number of ways. They're there to be blamed when necessary for the ills of society, scapegoated we might say. But also the acts of charity that can be done to them help appease the conscience of those who have money without actually changing anything. And the thing is, if Peter and John had simply given money to this man, they would have then become complicit in the very system that was keeping him in his poverty. But they didn't give him money. They took a different and, dare I say, more Christ-like path, which challenged the very system and opened the door to transformation. Doing this was not without its consequences and the traumatic events of the next three chapters of Acts all arise from this specific incident of healing a lame man in the temple grounds. They discovered that if you take actions to subvert systems of control, if you distort the imbalances of power on which our hierarchical religious institutions are built and which shore up our stratified societal structures. Well, those powers have a way of fighting back, seeking to close down the transgressive power of raising someone up whose place in life has already been determined as disadvantaged. So Peter and John were arrested and put on trial for this. And dare I say, it may also be the case with us. So let's bring this story up to date a bit and hear it speak to our world. When we eventually get back to our building, we will enter it through our own beautiful doorway. Our be gate beautiful with its Normanesque arch has always marked the entrance to a building from which the church has ministered to the poor and the disadvantaged. And our historically strategic location on the boundary between wealth and privilege in Bloomsbury and the grinding poverty of the St Giles slums speaks of a commitment from the very beginning to reach out to the diverse communities of need around the church and nothing has changed in 170 years. The congregation of Bloomsbury has always sought to bring wealth and poverty together but to do so in ways that are genuinely transformational, that go beyond a handout. 
Bloomsbury at its best has always sought to challenge the transactional basis of, of what is of much of what's classed as charitable giving. So Bloomsbury over the years has never been just about giving to the poor. Bloomsbury is a church which from its founding day has sought to reach out and touch where we've extended the hand of friendship to raise people up, where we do not stand on our dignity. And so we have a long history of effective engagement with those who are homeless and disadvantaged. And this hasn't stopped. Did you know that even during lockdown, uh, people from Bloomsbury have been very active working with other churches through London citizens. Uh, we were behind a campaign to reopen the toilets of the West End, many of which were closed during the early stages of lockdown and to get better sanitary provision for those still living on the streets. We're currently in early stages of conversation about ways in which better mental health support might be offered to those who live with homelessness. The thing is, the best way of offering the love of Christ to those on the streets is changing. If you rewind back to when Bloomsbury started cooking food, for those who are homeless, that was the dominant need. These days, uh, Dawn has often said, it's quite hard to go homeless or hungry, uh, homeless and hungry in London. There are agencies far better equipped than us, ensuring that people are fed. So as we consider our future engagement as a church with those who live without housing, my challenge for us today is to start thinking differently about how we might reach out to them in the name of Christ. We've already changed the way we were doing Sunday lunches and regrettably, I think they're unlikely to be starting anytime soon in any form, but we did put a stop to the long queue for food outside the gate of the church. And that doesn't mean we stopped caring for those who are homeless. We were doing really creative things on a Tuesday evening with the evening centre. But the question now going forwards, I think, is what might it take for us to reach out the hand and lift people up as Peter did, so that they no longer need to queue for food? What would it mean for us to look people in the eye and see the person behind the circumstance. What if we could discover that the least interesting thing about a homeless person is that they are homeless? Lockdown has forced us to stop many of our current engagements with those who are homeless, from Sunday lunch to the Tuesday evening centre to the choir with no name. All of those have come to a long-term halt. And it is quite likely that some, if not all of these, will be unable to restart in the foreseeable future. But the need is not gone. So my challenge for us as we think about the future is to ask the question of what it is that we can do before God that is genuinely transformational of the needs of our city. Let's ask what the needs are and be prepared to listen to those who might tell us that the genuine need is not perhaps what we think it is. Can we find ourselves willing to let go of our own programmes and structures and instead to construct new systems that are built on relationships that are genuinely transformational? Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but this I give you. And it doesn't have to be about giving alms or providing food or offering a service that users can access. There may be different and dare I say better ways of creating places of refuge, of safety, of friendship, of creativity through our congregation, where each person is known and valued as a person loved and unique in God's sight, where we take them by the hand and raise them up. Transformation is God's responsibility, not ours. We're not the ones who have to do the miracle. We just have to be prepared to look someone in the eye and reach out a hand of openness and trust to see the individual behind the circumstance. 
And this is a risky task. It's dangerous because it's disruptive. It messes with our systems and it plays havoc with our expectations, every bit as much as Peter and John's actions outside the beautiful gates of the temple subverted the systems that the temple had in place to ensure the poor got just enough money to tide them over until tomorrow when they could come back again. I suspect that in the example of Peter and John, we can find a model for our own future engagement with the homeless, where we resist the seductions of superficial solutions, such as throwing money and resources at a problem, and where instead we invest in relationships and holistic engagement, making ourselves vulnerable and responding creatively to the needs of the city. Bloomsbury's ministry to the homeless is not finished, far from it, but it will have to change and evolve as the needs of the city evolve. But in that change, we will discover a rich resource from scripture, calling us into paths of transformation, not just for those we are ministering to, but for ourselves as well. I'm going to hand back over to Luke now to lead the discussion. Thank you, Simon. Before we come to our time of discussion, where I'll invite the panelists to contribute, as well as your conversation in the chat, we're just going to have a moment of reflection to consider what we've heard. So if our panellists for today would like to put on their cameras and their microphones. So we have Solomon, Tommaso and Jean-Marc and Evelyn. Thank you for being willing to share with us this morning. I find this particular topic really challenging. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all have to think about it, but also in the chat function, so do share. Already some of you are commenting and sharing some reflections, so I'll come to those shortly. Um, and I, I found it fascinating what Simon started with around this idea of marginality can become the focus of description that those who don't experience that marginality focus on. And I think that happens not just when we're talking about those in poverty, but it happens in so many other contexts as well. But also interesting, um, when I was on the London Overground yesterday, um, there was an automated announcement. I don't know how long it's been part of that, but where they are now encouraging people to instead give money to the people that walk along the uh, carriages asking for small change, to instead give to a specific charity that I now can't remember off the top of my head what that charity was. But there is an evolving narrative in London around what it looks like to engage with those in poverty. And I think Bloomsbury's position in that conversation is essential. Now, I definitely don't have the answers to what that looks like, but I'm wondering how we might begin to challenge that transactional status quo particularly in this time of pandemic when it will look like for the foreseeable future we won't be able to do the things that we used to do. So I'm wondering if the panellists had any initial thoughts or uh, questions yourselves around some of the things that Simon was talking about or any ideas or suggestions that you had about things that Blues you might be able to do in the future. Unfortunately, not many ideas, but uh, I, I very much feel the challenge you, you, you talked about. And it seems to me the most difficult um, challenge to overcome is how do you create a real personal level playing field in interacting with, with people in need or in, in distress? How do you get rid of this almost unconscious bias you have in making moral judgment as to who deserves or who doesn't deserve and, and, and 
how lecturing one can sometimes feel in, you know, what should be the solution, but always looking down on these persons without the real consideration, respect and dignity that one should be able to, to bring as, as someone who thinks they know better and uh, because, you know, we have a better situation and we have the power and the money that we think we somehow deserve. How, how to get rid of that at the very personal level, I think is the starting point. And then from there, you know, you come with ways in which to help, whether it's with, with money or with shelter or with training or simply with, with, with moral support. But that starting point I find the most challenging. Yeah, for sure. And I think that lends itself, thank you, Jean-Marc, it lends itself to what Libby was saying in the comments around a meal being a good way to begin with, to engage and befriend with the, the, the stranger, the other. Um, and I think that when Simon was talking as well, it made me think of the kind of rhetoric of no conversation about us without us. I wouldn't ever encourage a conversation around racial inequality without hearing from people of colour and without centering the narratives around people of colour in the same way that I wouldn't with LGBTQ plus inclusion, that you, you know, you have to centre and privilege those voices. So you know, we need to start exploring ways in which we can engage and center the narratives and, and prioritize and privilege the, the minority in this context, those who are experiencing poverty or homelessness. Um, and that's incredibly difficult given the dispersed nature of homelessness, the fact that it's so challenging to meet at the moment and how do you gather together. There are so many complications that we have to explore above and beyond all the things that you were just articulating. Yeah, I like also the idea of, of Libby too, that uh, if you share a meal with somebody, it's not about their homelessness anymore because you're shifting on a different uh, place and then you can listen and uh, exchange. So I think this is a good place to start because you, you bring them out of their context, which is the street and you're not focusing on that anymore and you're focusing on something else. Yeah. Uh, Peter, thank you, Evelyn. Peter also shared um, that apparently that announcement on the overground that I alluded to has been around for about a year now, so often I use the overground, um, and uh, it was asking for money to be donated to the Whitechapel project. Um, Solomon, Tommaso, any thoughts or reflections so far? There's lots of comments coming in on the chat, but I'll, I'll go to the panellists first. May I uh, say something? Um, I mean, um, from a from a kind of more perhaps theoretical point of view, but um, I think that uh, what what really matters in in a way is uh, the aim we set ourselves when we help the poor and those in need, uh, because you know, after all, even in ancient Rome, emperors who used to provide free food from time to time uh, to certain segments of the population. But, but the purpose of the policy was not to empower ordinary people, but rather to keep them quiet, to forestall rebellions and strengthen the institutional foundations of the empire. And there are plenty of similar examples in history. Um, whereas if we draw from a different uh, tradition, like the, the Christian social tradition, for example, uh, there we can find a real focus and real emphasis on increasing agency. Um, the, the, the big difference is that uh, between an approach which emphasizes like material well-being in order to prevent people from reacting to injustice, engaging in politics, being active citizens and so on and so forth, and a different approach which rather emphasizes the importance of welfare in order to allow people to be free, to make free and responsible choices. And so whatever policies we, we may decide to pursue, whatever arrangements we may find, I think it's worth stressing that the focus should always be in enhancing people's opportunities to do what they want. Um, and, and, and that's a very, very powerful, um, I think, message 
that, that comes from, again, the, the social gospel and the Christian social tradition. Absolutely. Thank you, Tommaso. And I think that also l lends itself into what's being said in some of the comments as well. So Sandy shared about experiences during Open Doors and the, the value of peer support groups and, and hearing from people themselves. Um, and you, Tommaso, mentioned around agency and, and giving people the power to make decision. Um, and I think there's potentially a position for Bloomsbury to play in that and, and be part of policy change and enacting change that enables people to take some agency and some control over their own lives. And then Helen sh shared as well the sort of the toilet conversation, as she's called it, the, um, when Simon mentioned earlier about um, the toilets being opened up again across uh, Westminster, that came about from agencies, charities and churches, etc., who have lots of experience and expertise. So there's, there's power in collaboration and partnership. You know, Bloomsbury doesn't have to solve this by itself in the middle of London? How can we work together to bring about this, this impactful change that you were just alluding to, Tommaso? Solomon, yeah. did you have any thoughts? Yes, my thought is, um, is, 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 is to, to reflect on, on the silver and gold aspect, which is, I see as very transactional. And we, we have become very transactional in, in the way we do things nowadays, we, uh, what we can give, what somebody can give us, and our expectation. I think this lesson teaches us about being more relational. We, we ought to be more relational. I mean, relation, building relationship to, to help somebody in whatever, whatever situation they might find themselves. I think it's very important than the transactional aspect of, of, of life. For example, in the homelessness issue, you know, it, it, I mean, that's too many facets to, to that, you know, people might have the personal situation, family situation. All of those things are, are you know, the background of, of, of broken down relationship, you know. Sometimes it can be family, sometimes it can be um, uh, social issues, you know. But that is also a breakdown in relationship. So what I think we should be seeking is the relationship aspect. Like what Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury could do is to focus more on, on, on building relationship with, 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 with people, whether they're homeless or they, they, you know, they have any other social issues that or those are open to build relationship. I think that that's, that, that's what I think will, will help us you know, as, 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 as Christians, because building relationships, I think is key to, to resolving a lot of issues, you know, then the transactional aspect, because we become so transactional, I think, in my view. Anybody you, 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 you meet nowadays is to be thinking about what you can give and what they can give you, or well, there's too many expectations of a transaction, then building up relationship with, with people. Thank you, Solomon. And we you know we have a perfect example of what relational ministry looks like in Christ. And we worship a God that exists in relationship. The Trinity is in relationship with the Trinity. Um, and so it, we have a perfect witness in how to, to engage with one another and, and what that model looks like. And that speaks a little bit to what um, Matthew's comment is. And I, and I won't read it all out because we don't have time, but do flick up in the chat and see what he's written. Um, he talks about a, a program um, that he watched on the BBC. And although there, there were the need for the relationship, the relationships rather, in someone's life, as well as the financial resource, you know, it, money only goes so far. Food we all need. We all need these, these staples. But actually, it's relationship structures that support and enable us to grow and succeed. I think all of us can look back in our lives and, and note people who have been so impactful. Um, and it probably wasn't because they gave us a wadge of cash. Um, it was probably because they spoke to us in a, in a moment of need or perhaps to give us a word of encouragement or they set us on the path of, of, of where we are now. And so that, that, that period of that, that process of relationship is, is absolutely essential. Does anyone have any further closing thoughts while I just quickly see if there are any other comments to share? There are lots of comments in the chat, so I'm not going to be able to get them through all of them, but any other comments from the panellists? In 
in that case, there's just one comment from Ian that again, I won't read the whole thing, um, but there's just one thing perhaps for us to consider and ponder before we move um, on in our service this morning around part of what we bring when we, when we consider these conversations, our own personal baggage perhaps, and that's the word that Ian's used. Um, what do we feel that we have to get is perhaps there's a level of, of guilt there, perhaps a level of um, do we need to, do I feel like I have to respond? Am I feeling ashamed of something? And so perhaps considering what the transformation, not only for the individual that we're trying to engage with, but what the transformation in our lives look like and the gospel message is for everyone. So what does that, that process of transformation look like? How can we, you know, Tommaso spoke to the, the social gospel, this gospel of inclusion, um, and Solomon spoke of relationship. What does it look like for us to go on this journey together, not be givers and receivers, but all come under Christ and all find a way together to navigate these complicated questions? You all had a lot to say on this, um, and I'm very conscious of time. So do continue to ponder. There's lots of comments that still have, are coming in the chat, so feel free to keep sharing in that way. But for now, we're going to move the service on um, and we are going to hear from our musical group this morning. Um, the kingdom of God is justice and joy. So thank you to our panelists. Feel free to take off your microphones and your videos and uh, Simon will kick off our musical um, contribution. come to a time of communion where we share bread and wine together which will be led by Simon and Solomon. Jesus said very truly I tell you whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh.
So I mean, I'm having a little bit of problem here. My text just went off. Uh, okay, so does that mean you can't see it? Because I'm showing. I can't see the text. Yeah. And um, I wonder if one of the other panelists can see it and or, step in and read the. Word. Okay, I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm seeing it now. You're okay, are you, Solomon. Yeah. Right. Sorry about it. That's okay. Right. We are scattered. We are the people of God. We are the body of Christ. We are scattered and the body of Christ is broken. But as we gather, the body of Christ is remembered. So together we gather in obedience to Jesus' command. To remember and to share together in breaking bread and drinking wine. In remembrance of the death of Christ. Each piece of bread that we eat was once scattered across the fields. And the grain that God gave to grow has become for us the bread of life. Each sip of wine that we drink was once many vines. And the grapes that God gave to grow have become for us the new wine of God kingdom. In our communion with one another, we are fed with the bread of heaven that sustains and we drink the wine of gladness that brings us joy. The people of Israel were sustained by God through their years of wilderness wandering. The Israelites eat manna 40 years until they come to a habitable land. They eat manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. God rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. And we too are God's people, sustained by God through the witness of this word. Jesus said to his disciples, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven but it is by it is my father my father who gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of heaven for the bread for the bread of god is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me would never be hungry. And whoever believes in me would never be thirsty. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread, said a blessing, broke it, and gave it to them with the words, This is my body. It is for you. Do this to remember me. Later he took a cup of wine, saying, This cup is God's new covenant. Seal with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. So now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of the world which Christ will make special. And as he said a prayer before sharing, let us do so too. Let us pray. God of all those who are scattered and broken, you call us to wholeness. 
we thank you for the love demonstrated in giving your son that we might be united with you. We thank you that in Christ you enter into the pain, uncertainty and fear of our world and that your arms are open in loving embrace, gathering us to you as a mother hen gathers her brood under her wing and as a shepherd gathers his flock. We thank you for bread and wine, symbols and signs for us today of your faithfulness to your people through all generations. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, all nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will guide him and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. Let us share in bread together. Then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been scattered and came to the land of Judah, to Gedalia and Mizpah, and they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance. Let us share in wine together. Jesus said, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the word, you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. And so after sharing bread and wine together, we come to a time of prayer, which Tommaso is going to lead us in. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we gather before you this morning in a time of uncertainty and anxiety, but also of hope and relief as communities, as well as individuals all over the world, slowly adjust themselves to new rules, new patterns of behavior, and new ways of living together, cooperating, interacting, intermingling with each other, but also resume some of their old habits, activities and practices. While enjoying some of the freedoms we had temporarily given up just a few months ago, may we remember the hard lessons learned and commit ourselves with renewed energy and determination to your words of love and redemption throughout this collective process of adaptation and renewal. Loving God, we pray for those who have been made vulnerable by the pandemic, 
experiencing new and sometimes unprecedented forms of insecurity and exclusion. Fearing for their health, their jobs, their future. Having their dreams shattered, their projects shelved, and their relationships strained. May they feel your much needed presence and find comfort in you as they strive to pick up the pieces and embark on new challenges and journeys. Loving God, we pray for those who already lived on the margins of society well before the pandemic broke out, such as the homeless in our cities and have now been pushed even further into the background as more pressing, more visible, and often more influential interests have been taking precedence over theirs, getting the lion's share not only of our handouts, but also, and perhaps more critically, of our attention and our concerns. Loving God, we pray for those who seek to redress these and other imbalances, either through volunteering or through their own profession, giving a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven you announced. We pray for the healthcare workers who help the sick and the injured regardless of their income, for the teachers and the librarians who provide kids with educational opportunities no matter where they come from, for the lawyers who offer free legal aid in the name of inalienable human rights. Finally, we pray for ourselves. May we master the energy we need to be instruments of justice, faithful to your teachings, inspired by your example, grateful for the blessings we receive every day. Amen. Amen. And we continue our time of prayer as we give thanks, not only for the financial gifts that you all continue to contribute to Bloomsbury, but also the gifts of service. We continue to serve ourselves as a community and to serve God in the wider community of London, even with the stresses and strains that it produces in this time of pandemic. So let's give thanks. Lord of all good gifts, we offer you our own gifts, demonstrating our gratitude and seeking your wisdom in how to be good stewards of them. In these uncertain times, light our paths. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our formal time of gathering as provoking faith is coming to an end now. Uh, there will be, as always, a continued opportunity for the chat to carry on after the service. So do do that. Um, remember that just transition, which is timely because Susan has just posted that as I was speaking, it almost planned. Um, do, do engage with that process. The link is there in the chat function. And also, if you are able to come back together at 2 p.m., it's on that different link that was shared around by a shared prayer but come back to close our week of prayer at 2 p.m. today for 30 minutes. So to close, a blessing. Creator God, challenge us today to be your stewards, not your emperors. Redeemer God, remind us today that your body is for all, not for the few. Sustainer God, fulfill us with your presence today empowering us to act. Holy God, three in one, be exalted in word and thought and song and deed. Amen. <laughs>